Again, hello everyone, this is Sue Ann at DPI. If you can hear me, would you please raise your hand on the control panel? We seem to be having a little bit of technical difficulty with our sound. Okay, I am now using my computer, the phone for some reason just didn't like us this afternoon. So I'm going to be using my phone, my computer. Um, so when Aaron talks, he may sound a little muffled. We'll try to get really close together so that you can hear him. But if you can't hear him, please let us know. This is the elementary scheduling webinar on the live side. DPI recommends that you actually schedule your elementaries through Power Scheduler, and you can do that basically the same way you do your middle schools and high schools. You can copy your master schedule over into Power Scheduler, do all of your tweaking there on that master schedule in Power Scheduler. You do not have to load your students there. You do not have to do anything else, and then just commit that back to the live side when you commit the rest of your schools. Today we're going to talk about creating your master schedule after EOY. This is when, if you're going to do it on the live side, we recommend that you copy your master schedule then. So everything should already have been completed as far as years and terms, as far as course availability, teachers, all of that should already be completed. In the school that I am in here now, we're going to assume that EOY has been completed and we are in the 15-16 school year. EOY has run. The first thing you want to be sure and check and do when you are in the 15-16 school year is you want to go to the school. You want to scroll down to years and terms. You want to find your 15-16 year, make sure it's there. Then you want to click on edit terms. Here, depending on the terms that you have for your schools, you may only see year long. This elementary school happens to have just year long courses. You may also see your two semesters. You may also see quarters if you have nine weeks courses. But what you want to do is you want to click on this blue hyperlink and make sure that the import file term number is added into this box. Okay, even if you're doing this in Power Scheduler, you want to make sure you do the same thing there so that when the commit comes back, it will come back to the proper place. So that's the first thing you want to do after, before you start to, to copy your schedule. Okay, that's completed. Then what you're going to do is you're going to go into System, down under scheduling, you're going to click on copy master schedule. Here you want to make sure that you are in the proper school. This is a very important step, source year. This is the year that the master schedule is being copied from. So here we want to put 1415. Our master schedule from last year is coming to the current year. Target year, the school year that the master schedule is being copied to, which would be 1516. The next two checkboxes are very important. Clear existing scheduling terms in the destination school year. Check that box. If you do not check that box, your terms will be still be the 1415 term ID of 24, 2401, 20, 2400, 2401, 2402, and so on. So you do definitely want to check that clear existing schedule terms in the destination school year, and you want to check the box to confirm that you want to proceed. You're going to click Submit. You may get a message like this. The following courses are unavailable for the target year. The sections associated with the course will not copy. You may get a lot of this. It may be courses that DPI has ended. It may be courses that you've ended at the school level. So know that those sections are not going to be there. You're going to have to recreate them. Or you need to fix this before you go on. Click Submit.
and it will process for a while. I'm hoping that this training database will let it process on through. As we wait on it, I would not because you may create duplicates. The question was if you've copied one time, can you copy again? I would not because you may create duplicates of everything that is in there. Um, I will have to do a little bit more checking and make sure that that is true, but a lot of times if you copy something that's already been copied, you create a duplicate of it because it will give it another ID number. <clears throat> so it's finished. It says the changes have been recorded. So here's a really here's the good question. Sheila is asking, did you say you have to wait until after EOY to do this? No. The question was, did I say you have to wait till after EOI to do this? No, I did not say that. I said we recommend that you do this. You can do this from the current year. Um, you just need to be really, really careful <clears throat> when you do it during the current year because if you end up changing terms or changing sections or changing periods and you're not in the 15-16 school year, you have orphaned a bunch of records for the 14-15 school year. It's a safety thing. You can work on it now or you can work on it later. Just be sure if you do this before EOY and you are manipulating your schedule, you are manipulating the 15-16 stuff and not accidentally manipulating your 14-15 stuff. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Once you've copied that master schedule, it's basically the same thing that you do this year. You can go into courses and look at your courses. You can also go into sections. You now should have sections set up for each of these courses. If you'll notice here, the term is like 1516, elementary music. 15, 16. Keep in mind, this school only has year-long courses. Had we not checked that box to change that term, you might have come here and, and seen 14, 15. That's what that little checkbox does, is it clears out those old terms and allows this 15, 16 to be added. So just a, just a few quick follow-ups. Mm -hmm. So I think if you commit the master schedule from Power Scheduler, you would still need to copy after EOY. No. no. You will do one or the other. Either work in Power Scheduler and commit or work on the live side and do the process that Sue Ann is showing you now. And that also goes to Connie's question. If you've already started working in Power Scheduler, just do your thing there and commit over. You can do this either way. Definitely do not work in both places. That was some issues we had last year that people worked in both places and the commit process would not work. So you want to do, as Aaron says, either live side or power scheduler. Truly, we recommend power scheduler because it's a very simple process. When you're working in your 15-16 school year in power scheduler, you have no chance of messing up the 14-15 school year. Power Scheduler for elementary schools works basically the same way as it does for your high schools and your middle schools. You're going to create that scenario. You're going to make sure your years and terms are correct. You're going to copy that master schedule. Go back and redo the steps that's in that um, load only book for you, but you're never going to load. You're just going to go to your sections and create those um, Dependent sections if you want those, and you're going to tweak anything that needs to be tweaked. 
Now, that's not to say if you don't know where your students are going, you can mass enroll them in Power Scheduler. They'll be enrolled, and then when you commit them back to the live side, they'll be there. Okay, we've got a question. So when we copied our schedule, we didn't check that clear terms box. What now? Didn't check the clear terms box. If you will send me an email with the school, I will check on it for you. And if we need to have the service desk clear it out for you, I will let you know. We may be able just to update those terms, but I have to check and make sure um, which way we need to do it. Let's see. The question was, do section attributes copy over when you copy your schedule? This is an elementary school math grade one, section three. Let's scroll down and see. In a related question that was, do dependent sections copy over and those do? Yes, dependent sections do copy over. This has really nothing in there, and like I said, this is a training database. I would assume that they do, but please don't take me at my word on that because a lot of the section attributes were not in there last year. If you copied your master schedule last year, we've had to go back and put them in by hand. And I hope and pray that they copy over for you. Um, but we'll do a little bit more checking on that if Aaron can make a note of that, and um, we'll see if we can find that out for you. Melinda said, we found that attributes do not copy. Okay. And um, Kay Roberts is also saying some of it doesn't. Okay. So we've had a couple people who have already done this process that say attributes do not copy. And, and I can kind of understand that because some of the attributes may be different from year to year. Um, that's all I can say about that. <laughs> okay. Once you're in a course, and in this section, I've clicked on the homeroom activity period. You can create dependent sections if, if you haven't and you would like to. What you do is you just click on the section itself. You scroll down to where it says dependent sections. There we go. That's too far. All right there they are. And if you'll notice, this school has created dependent sections. It is in the course number dot section number format, comma separated, no space. Course number, dot, section number, comma separated between the courses, no space. What will happen is then when you enroll a child in this activity period, I'm going to pick section 41 of this course. I'm going to go back to my students' pages. Pick a child. These are 15, 16. It's not going to allow me to do it. You shouldn't actually do this until after you've, um, after EOI, the email went out that said not to enroll students into courses until after EOI. So you want to be sure that that's what you do. You wait till after EOI. There's the course number. We're going to see if we can find it. And I said it was section 41. I'm going to click on it. 
it's not allowing me to create it here. What happens though is that when you click on this section of activity period, it will enroll that student in that homeroom plus all of the other section that sections that you have associated independent sections for that course for that student. Tweaking your master schedule you want to do all of that work before you ever enroll a student in a course. So we're going to go back to school. I'm going to scroll down to sections. And we're just going to pick this third grade science course. Section 33, let's say. The teacher for this course is no longer going to be this teacher. So we can actually remove her and we can add a new teacher. Probably what you should do for purposes of this and SAR and PMR and all of that information instead of removing them is to actually make their end date the first day of the enrollment that courses start. So where I removed her, what you can do in section 32, if you want to keep a really, really accurate record, because we've not enrolled anybody yet, we can actually modify this. Let me go forward. There we go. Duh. We're going to say August the 25th. And we're going to submit that. That way you keep an accurate record of what you had, where that teacher was. It's not going to let me do that in this training database either. But if you've not had any students enrolled in the class, there's not been any instructional days, you're fine to go ahead and change that before you start to enroll students and have instructional days. Okay? You may want to change the section number, or not the section number for that course. You can also do that. You may change the period. Just make sure that you are being accurate with your periods, your days, all the information. Keep in mind that sometimes it will come back and not have all of the full information there. So you want to make sure when you make these changes, that you do see the expression, the section, the term, all the information needs to be across there, that it's accurate for that school year. Doris has a good question. She says that they've been working in Power Scheduler, but that the principal's really shaking things up and they don't want any of that. Is it okay to not commit and then copy after EOY? That is perfectly all right. Anything you do in Power Scheduler, if you do not commit it, you don't have to worry about it. It goes away. It can stay there forever. Okay? Do we have any other questions? How can you change the number of location days if we copied our master schedule? So, you're going to go to school, days, and you're going to check and see what you have here. If you're sure you want to check it, change it. Years and terms, you're going to find it. Click on the year itself not the edit, but the year itself, you can actually physically change your number of periods, change your number of rotation days. But here's what I will say to you before you do this. If you are decreasing your days and decreasing your periods, make sure you clean up anything that's attached to those periods before you delete them. Okay? 
courses, let's say you've got courses that are going from period 13 down to period 12. Just go ahead and make that change in sections and then once all those period 13s are cleared up, you can come right back here and change this to period 12. Okay? The problem with changing days, if you're going down, you kind of have to do the same process. You need to go, if you're going from two days down to one, just go to those courses that are two days. Just check A day, not B day, and then when you change it to one, that B day will disappear. You don't want to leave that B day checked and change it to one because that leaves orphaned records for you out there. How should we handle scheduling if the bell schedule is changing dramatically for next year? Okay. Bell schedule really has nothing to do with this scheduling at this point. Bell schedule is done after you've got your periods and days set up. So you need to re-enter your bell schedule. So you're going to have to determine what your periods look like and then once those periods are set up and the courses are attached to them, then you're going to have to create your bell schedule. Yeah, and the other the it's going to be a break-even point for you. If you want the sections, but you're going from semesters to year-long or year-long to semesters, you're going to have to reterm or re-express your sections. It's up to you whether you decide it's easier to copy and fix or simply start with a blank slate and build them all from scratch. Neither one is wrong, but it's up to you to decide which is a better workflow for you. That's that's kind of it's got to be it's got to be a decision that you make. Both involve a little bit of work. Now, once you're on the live side, before you start to enroll students in classes, you want to make sure that your calendar is set up after EOI, okay? So you're going to go to school, calendar set up. Because before you enroll students in a class, you need to have your dates showing here. You need to have the cycle day. This is a one-day school. You need to have a bell schedule set up so that you can attach it to the calendar. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six is track. They're either all checked or all unchecked. Either way is fine for a regular school. In session needs to be checked if it is a school day. One is a day that the students are counted present. A day that the students are not there should look like this Saturday, the 29th, no checks, and a zero. So before you start to actually physically schedule students in a class, you need to have this bell schedule, uh, this calendar set up. You can then, of course, mass enroll your kids in courses just like you've done at the present time on the live side. Because you're in the live side, you're doing the same thing you've always done. I would not set up my 1516 calendar pre EOI because you only have one calendar in there. And if you start to change those dates, yeah, it's it's going to mess up your current year. So, no, that has to happen after EOI. Now, one thing I will remind you if your bell schedule is changing drastically and that means your number of periods are changing, your amount of time in the classes are changing, and your amount of time that your kids are in school physically, you'll need to um, do your attendance conversion to match that and make sure that that's correct for the coming year. We will be doing a webinar shortly after EOY about all the things that truly need to be set up at the beginning of the school year. We've already started to work on that process. I know they're working on EOI things, so there's going to be a webinar on that. I think they've already had one. Um, so,
Erin's looking. It does look like a 1516 calendar is in there, but I would really hesitate to make any changes on that until after EOI. Because remember, an email went out from NCSYST that you, NCSYST, NCSYS, that you do not want to register any students in 1516 courses until after EOI. So that's when your calendar needs to be set up, is after EOI. And basically, that is all there is to elementary scheduling on the live side. Erin, can you come up with some other things that, that we might want to cover? I just tried a dependent section. It wouldn't let me do it. Yeah. So we tried to enroll a student in a dependent section, and you saw that it would not allow me to do that. Basically, that's what you're going to do. You're going to pick your student. You're going to go down to... Um, Modify his schedule. We're going to find that one that I just had. See, this is unable to create section enrollment. So, but that's the process that you take. I think it's just this training database. I know we got an email that they were doing some things to the training database, so that may be one of them. We can also mass enroll students in sections. So I'm going to just say functions. Mass enroll. You come up with the same screen. You can enter the course and the section number. Mm -hmm. Enroll. Now, when you come here, you want to be sure that this enrollment date is the first day that the student physically is going to set their seat in a seat. And during the summer, they're all going to be 825. But anytime you're doing this after school begins, you want to make sure that that's the correct date. It's going to enroll all of these kids. If you'll notice, in all of these sections that were independent sections attached to the homeroom section that I put them in. And again, it's it's this database is not allowing me to create that. So that's the process. Could you talk about teams? Yeah. At this point, if you're going to use teams, Aaron asked me to talk about teams. If you're going to use teams, you're going to pick your students. And you can assign them to a team, but you already know the teacher that's on that team, and you're going to mass enroll them. So it's basically that information. Um, here, you see it says next year team. It doesn't have a current year team. Doris? Kits is really, really good at teams. <laughs> so if, if you need something done with teams, give Doris a, an email and um, she'll be able to get with you and help you work on setting up some of those teams and, and how they work. Summer exit date. I'm not sure what you're asking. A withdrawal date. Okay. Okay. Withdrawal date. The system 
is going to if you um, when they do EOI, it'll use a particular date. The withdrawal date, I don't think there's any physical date that's set up. At some point, DPI may recommend a date to use. I would be consistent about the date you use so that if you want to pull a report of students withdrawn during the summer, you know that they're all withdrawn on a particular date. You can use that date in your poll to also verify that you've gotten accurate information. Okay, Aaron's saying he thinks they want 7-6 for withdrawal date. We will verify that and let you know for sure. We'll actually um, have them add that hopefully in the EOI information so that you will have that on those webinars. Okay. Someone asked if we could go over the rule for the name of uh, period and day abbreviations. So, under school, if I can get down here, days. Days should be letters only. A, B, C, D. Just keep them consistent. Okay, school setup. Periods is a little bit different. According to the rules for DPI, North Carolina, periods are numeric. Periods should never begin with a zero in the name or the abbreviation. Now, what you can have if you click on period one, you can name this period 61, abbreviation 61. What you need to keep in mind when you do this is that expressions sometimes Reports that you pull sometimes will show the period number, not the name or the abbreviation that you have given it. So some of the reports that you pull for your principal are going to show period one, not period 61. So that's something to keep in mind. We have suggested that you actually can use section numbers to do this. Teachers can see section numbers if they will go to their preferences in Gradebook and check the little box. They can actually see section numbers. You have a period one, okay? Section could be 61, sixth grade, first period. 62, sixth grade, seventh period. Section number 71, seventh grade, first period. You say that you often have more than one section of that same course number. 61, sixth grade, first period. 16, first period, sixth grade. 11, six, 116, first period, sixth grade. 611, sixth period, first grade. So you can have three digit section numbers. That may be a way to get around this so that you can leave the periods named exactly what they are. Totally up to you. This can be done. Name and abbreviation is to be numeric. Just be aware when you do this that a lot of the reports and things that you pull will pull the period number. You can move these up. Just know a lot of the reports and the student schedules print those in numeric order or period number order. So even though you've pulled it to the top, when it prints on reports, it's probably on some of them going to print at the bottom again. It's really important to note that you 
you never want to use a leading zero anywhere in power school. The system just doesn't like it. It can really trip it up and lead to some funky things. Um, I have a question from Anna saying, like, what periods would you use for your kindergartners who are technically in grade zero? Um, you can use single digits or you can pick any other number series to go with your kindergartners. It's up to you, but don't name and abbreviate things with a zero. Also have a good question or statement from Debbie saying that it was recommended not to mismatch the period number with the name and abbreviation. This is where what the system can do breaks with what you might want to do. I'm kind of on the the school of thought that I want my period number to match my name and abbreviation. One, 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 two, two, two. That way, no matter what piece of data the system chooses to pull, whether it's pulling the name, the abbreviation, or that hard-coded number, you are always talking about the same piece of the system. You will, you will see if you rename or re-abbreviate your periods, Sometimes you're going to see that hard-coded period number, and it can get confusing, particularly if you do something like HR for 1, ER for 2, and then 1 for 3, 2 for 4, 3 for 5, because when you're looking at 2, is it the 2 from the period number, or is it the 2 from the name? So use this as you feel as though it's appropriate. I like mine to all just be 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3. It's something that you as a system need to decide or as a school need to decide and everybody that's involved in it needs to be aware of, of how you're doing it. We do not as trainers, do not recommend this way, but it can be done this way. I'm under the belief with Aaron it's better to leave them consistent. I know a lot of people use period numbers up through 99, they include up through 99 in their system and use period 61, 62, 63, 64 for their 6th graders, 71, 72, 73, 74 for their 7th graders, so on and so forth. That's so that's, a, that's the way I've seen it done and that just keeps everything reading consistent. Right. But if your period lengths for all of your students are the same, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, and you have this, or first kindergarten through fifth grade, and you have the same number of periods each child's attending, then you could use the section numbers. You want to make sure that in your courses at the school level, you have all of the courses that you're going to need to schedule students. Remember, there's no longer a self-contained. Each student needs to be registered in a period for their courses. Art. Art for a kindergartner may be on Monday at 2 o'clock, period 4. They need to have a section of art, period 4, on day 1 for kindergarten. Second grade may be period 3 on Tuesday. You need to make sure we do not want an art teacher having all of her art classes scheduled at the same time. That does not work for EVOS. They need to be scheduled on the days and in a period separately. If you do not have all of the courses here that you need, speak to your coordinator and she may be able to help you. You may also want to go to manage courses for this school and check on unavailable. She may have already given the course to your school and it may be here in the unavailable information for you. Okay. 
So you want to look in those two places, but she would be the one who would help you get the courses that you need for the school year. Please check the NCSIS website for the 1516 course list, making sure that you have active courses. If you are using Power Scheduler to schedule your course catalog, if it has any red triangles in it, please keep in mind those will not commit back to the live side. Anything that's attached to those will not commit back. So just a couple of really good questions. Francine just wants that bit about EVOS repeated. So each, each course that a student is going to take needs to exist in a different period. They can't be co-assigned. So you can't do things like the old self-contained. Like they can't be in one period all day with the teacher and then simply teach them English, science, math, and social studies. English has to be a chunk. Math has to be a chunk. Science has to be a chunk. Social studies has to be a chunk. From a teacher perspective, like if I'm the art teacher, all of my first grade art classes can't be in period one. Each group that I meet has to have their own unique period and chunk of time because when this all ties into the EVOS system, that's how the students are going to be identified and rostered, and that all comes back to instructional minutes for students and for teachers. This is not new. Um, this was the big shift two or three years ago, but this is no, no change this year, just what we've been doing. We have had some issues with that this year, so that's why we wanted to stress that. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Cynthia is asking terms. Do they need to match the intervals desired for report cards? No, mostly. The term is going to indicate when that section is in session. So a year-long course will start on the first day of school and end on the last day. A semester one course will start on the first day of school and end on the end date of semester one, sometime probably in January. And S2 will start the day after that and run through the last day of school. In final grade setups is where you indicate what grades you want to store, like Q1, Q2, T1, T2, E1, F1, for any given course. A year-long course may only have a final grade. It may have four quarter grades and a final grade. A course can be taught in the semester and have two nine weeks grades, three six weeks grades. It could have nine every other week grades. Anything you want to establish. The term is simply the length of the course. So John's asking for a clarification on how expressions connect to the periods in a bell schedule. The number in the expression is the period. And you put that period on the bell schedule, which, which puts it during a physical chunk of time. You say period one runs from 8 to 9.30, so things expressed one meet from 8 to 9.30. So in that setup, where did my bell schedule go? They've moved this stuff around here a little bit. And Rebecca's asking if pre-K kids can be scheduled all day, just like a single thing. Pre-K kids don't follow the, those rules because they're not on EVA. So yes, as far as I know, yes. Sandra Johnson would be a good one to ask that to. Email Sandra and ask her that particular question. So John, here's what a bell schedule looks like. So I'm going to say here we've got period one. That is the expression for period one, period nine, ten. So we saw that this school had period 13. So here's what I would say is period 13. It may run from 7.30 in the morning to 8.30. Okay. That's how your expression connects to your bell schedule, through that period ID. kind of like to refer back to the one who was asking about if you're making major changes in your periods and days. 
the decision really is going to have to be yours, but I really would not even copy my master schedule. I don't think I would even do anything until after EOY with a school that's making all those major changes. Aaron's going over some questions here. So, Kay, you're saying if not all the specials can be in the same period? No. A student, and maybe, maybe I'm just not communicating properly, a student can only have one course in any given period in term. In first semester, I can only have one first period course. In second semester, one first period course. Teachers can teach multiples. As a teacher, I can teach you both Spanish 3 and Spanish 4 in first period, but as a student, I can only be enrolled in one course per period. Now, if you're talking about art on Monday, PE on Tuesday, computers on Wednesday in the same period, that's where your days come into play. Monday's art would be day one, period three. Tuesday's music would be day two, or day B, period three. Wednesday's computers would be day C, period three. All your other courses that meet every day would be A, B, C, D, E. Those courses would just have a one day attached to them, the particular day that they meet on within that same period. So Doris is asking about the scheduling of EC students. So EC students who receive inclusion services can remain scheduled in the main section with the regular kids, and the EC teacher will be tied to that section as teacher two or as the EC teacher, depending on what gradebook permissions you want. If they receive pullout services, the pullout is a separate section. And on NCSIS, if you look in the scheduling section, there is a great QRD on scheduling inclusion in resource students. Okay. Do we have any other questions coming up about scheduling elementary? Again, you can do this on the live side now. You can copy that master schedule and begin to tweak your sections. It is recommended that if you're doing that, be very, very, very careful because you don't want to accidentally make a change in the current year's information. You can wait until after EOY and copy that master schedule and start to tweak your information then before you ever enroll any students. If you do this before EOY, do not enroll students in courses. After EOY, make sure you've got all your changes completed before you enroll the students in courses. Making sure you don't leave any orphaned records if you change your periods and your days, make sure you clean all of that up before you actually physically go to years and terms and make that change. Make sure when you enroll students that you make sure the enrollment date is accurate. It says the first day of school. Keep in mind in your years and terms there is no padding. First day of school is the first day the students set their seats in a seat. Last day of school is the last day the students have their seats in a seat. If you have semesters, and let me see if I can find a school really quickly that has semesters. Oh, come on. It's not liking me too well today.
Nope, oh, that one just has years. I don't know if we have one that actually has semesters for 15, 16 or not. But here, I can go to 14, 15 and show you. What I want to point out and make very clear Keep in mind these dates are going to be wrong because I'm looking at 1415. Between your semesters, there is no gaps between semesters. Semester one will end on one day and semester two will start the very next day. The choice is yours and what we recommend is if semester one actually ends on 121, you extend and semester two begins on 124. You extend semester one to 123 so that when teachers enter information after 121, it will actually go to the accurate semester. So there are no, there's no padding on your years and terms, beginning dates, first day the students are in school, ending date is the last date the students have their seats in a seat, and no gaps between terms. If we have no other questions, I know this is slated for two hours, but really with elementary scheduling, as far as the scheduling setup and enrolling the students, there's not a lot. Just keep in mind those few things that we told you about having periods for each of those courses, having the correct course number for each of the courses, and I know you need to check that Excel spreadsheet often because it gets updated often. So. Just make sure that you do that. Now, one thing I do want to show you that you can do if a course number changes. Let's see if we actually have, let me go back to the elementary school because I know I have sections there. B4 you ever enroll a student in a class, you cannot do this after students are physically enrolled in the class, but if a course number changes, you can actually go come on, to the teacher's schedule to that section They fixed it because you used to be able to do a little pull down and reassociate the course number. And I guess on the live side you can't now because it causes problems if you do it once students are enrolled. So it looks like they've disabled that. In Power Scheduler, you can do that. So that's another advantage to scheduling even your elementary schools in Power Scheduler because once you've copied that master schedule over, if course numbers have changed, you can actually just go to that teacher schedule and reassociate the correct course number with each of those sections. All right, you said there was one you missed earlier? Question? All right, if there are no other questions, please keep in mind that if you've got something that comes up, email the service desk. You can also go ahead and when you get that email sent in through your coordinator, um, get the ticket number and just let Aaron and I know that you've got a ticket out there and what the ticket number is. As we get a chance, we will look at them and try to help you. We've asked that scheduling questions be handled quickly because we know EOI is coming up and these things need to be taken care of. Please remember, do not commit any of your schools until you hear from DPI, there is an issue with the commit process right now. They've discovered what the issue is and they're working it through Pearson to try and get it fixed. So wait patiently until you hear from DPI about committing. Once you hear that you can commit your schedules, please make sure that everything is completed for 1415 before you ever commit, make sure your grades are in, make sure your report cards are run, make sure your transcripts are accurate, 
Make sure all of that end of year information is completed before you commit the 1516 schedule back to Power Scheduler from Power Source. If there is nothing else, thank you for being with us today. And like I said, email us if you need us and email the service desk and we'll get back to you just as quickly as we can. Thanks and have a great weekend.